Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about NASA and ESA's plans to return uh, samples from Mars. Now, obviously, we've sent several spacecraft to Mars to study the surface, but getting samples back is like a whole order of magnitude more impressive in terms of the science that you can get. You can put a bunch of scientific instruments on there. You can put like X-ray spectrometers and you can zap it with lasers and look at it with microscopes. But if you can get samples back, we have entire buildings full of scientific equipment which can do all sorts of analysis and then it can react and try all sorts of new plans. So, you know, getting samples back was sort of one of the great justifications for the Apollo program, which really, of course, we all knew that it was just a big political exercise in propaganda and prestige. And to that effect, um, while NASA you know, did bring back hundreds of pounds or kilos of moon rocks, uh, the Soviet Union, they also wanted to respond in kind, and they sent a lunar spacecraft up, which grabbed a few ounces of lunar dirt and sent it back. Uh, China has also performed a lunar sample return mission, and for beyond the moon, Japan and, of course, NASA, they have also recovered or are in the process of recovering uh, materials from asteroids. And, you know, asteroids have sort of distances comparable to that of Mars. Mars, on the other hand, uh, is deep in a gravity well. It needs an escape velocity of about five kilometers per second. That's twice what there is from the moon. Although, you know, to be fair, there is atmosphere on Mars and you can lose a lot of velocity by using the Martian atmosphere for aero braking. So it doesn't, uh, actually, in terms of delta V, it's only about 10% more that's required to get a sample back from the moon versus getting a sample back from Mars. So it's not a huge deal more, but it's the time and distance that adds to the complexity. The fact that your hardware has to survive in deep space autonomously for a very long time. So the first serious proposal for a Mars sample return was by the Soviet Union, who were looking for a way to respond and one-up uh, NASA and the US. And they had the N1 rocket, and some scientists said, look, we could put a 100-ton spacecraft on this that would be able to fly to Mars, could land, get some samples and return. This was an absolute monster. And uh, yes, it required the N1 rocket, which didn't go very far. Now, they later came up with another design which required three launches on proton rockets. And I think there was one idea where they would actually take the samples back. Uh, the samples would be rendezvoused with in Earth orbit by a Soyuz. But um, yeah, they got as far as fabricating equipment for that before, you know, opinions changed and the government said this is way too risky and it'll be embarrassing if it fails. Uh, after the Viking spacecraft landed, Martin Marietta made their own study on a Mars sample return mission in 1978. And that was, of course, you know, great idea, but interest in Mars waned as the life sciences experiment turned up nothing conclusive. And of course, NASA's space budget got absorbed by the space shuttle. And during the 1980s, NASA basically didn't launch any planetary science missions. During the 1990s, there was a sort of resurgence in interest in Mars. Uh, and one of the sort of key moments that I remember is the claims of microscopic life being for, found inside, uh, you know, inside Martian meteorites. That is, meteorites have been found on Earth and later were identified in the 1980s based upon their noble gas uh, ratios to have come from Mars because we knew what the atmosphere of Mars contained and we found tiny bubbles inside these meteorites which pretty much matched that. So yeah, we began to see missions returning to Mars. We had, uh, of course, the sort of the, the one that sticks in memory most is Mars Pathfinder with the tiny Sojourner rover. Uh, you know, at this time, NASA had recovered from its malaise where it had stopped sending planetary science missions. It had a new motto of sending missions that were faster, better, and cheaper. You know, Pathfinder's entire mission cost was less than the cost of developing, developing the life detection experiment on the Viking landers. But then, of course, you know, faster, cheaper, better became faster, cheaper, spread across a wider area with the failure of Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander back to back. And so NASA had been planning like a more ambitious Mars sample return at that point, And that was canceled and scaled back as they began to reassess their approach. Now, at the time, it was sort of thought that, sure, getting a sample back from Mars would be cool, but 
you know, scientists said, well, we don't really understand where the best site to get samples from would be, right? You know, and since we've got all these random samples from meteorites, it would be hard to say that if you landed on a random part of Mars and took a sample, that it would be any better than any of these random chunks of meteor. Now, to be fair, meteorites tend to be strong rocks because they have to get kicked off the surface. That tend means they tend to be more volcanic. Um, whereas like soft or sedimentary rocks, which are more likely to contain, say, clues to possible history of life on the planet, those could crumble under the forces of impact and ejection. So NASA began to you know, pursue their more modern Mars mission. They sent more orbiters and landers and rovers to learn about Mars. Uh, the next serious attempt at a Mars sample return was 2008, when US and Europe got together, began working on another mission. And this included a European designed rover, which would be called ExoMars. And that would be also aimed to land alongside a US built rover called Max C, right? The Mars Astro Astrobiology uh, Explorer Cacher. The idea being that this rover would be a much simpler thing than the, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity. This would be about one third of the mass, much simpler. It would just go around picking up the samples based partly on what the ExoMars rover would be telling it. These samples would be cached and then a later mission would come along and return these to the Earth. And that went all, well, that didn't go anywhere because what happened was, of course, 2007, market crash, subsequent recession, government is forced, like there's a literal deal that says we will cut across the board 10%. Oh, by the way, no, we're gonna cut out the military. And that basically, you, the decision from the White House was, look, let's cut back Mars exploration. Let's keep SLS, let's keep commercial crew and all these other things. This Mars sample return thing, that's way off in the future. And that actually didn't go over very well with the public. Scientists were actually able to rally all sorts of people to their cause and say, why are you cutting this very popular, very public Mars exploration program? And so Mars 2020 was funded and that of course became Perseverance. And Perseverance is basically max C, but it's three times the mass. It's nuclear powered, it has a laser, and of course it has a really cool sidekick helicopter called Ginny. So while Perseverance was a lot bigger and heavier than what they actually needed for their original mission, it did have the benefit that it was based off an existing design, so they didn't need to develop that. Downside of that, of course, is that they are stuck with a computer that dates to 1997. And so Perseverance launched towards the Red Planet with the understanding that it would be collecting samples, it would be caching them and leaving them on the surface because, you know, if the rover failed, you didn't want to have all the cool samples locked inside it while the other rover's knocking on it and saying, let me in. Uh, no, it, it went to Mars and there wasn't a guarantee that there would be budget for a full Mars sample return. But now we have that budget and the plan started out a few years ago. Uh, it was originally talking about sending the rover, sending the spacecraft out in 2026. Recently, it's been dialed back to, or dialed to the right to 2028 with a sample return in about 2023. But this is an extraordinarily complex mission. It has to fit, because it has to fit everything onto small rockets. So right now, the latest version has three different uh, spacecraft that fly. First of all, there's a European spacecraft which will sit in orbit around the planet. This is going to fly out using, you know, uh, electric propulsion and it's getting and get into Martian orbit and sit there waiting for the other spacecraft. There is going to be a lander which contains a Mars ascent vehicle. That is a rocket that will take the samples back to space. And then there's another lander which is going to have the Mars sample fetch rover. Originally, the rover and the rocket were going to land on a single vehicle. But, you know, right now we know how to build a lander of a specific size and mass and get it through Mars's atmosphere and land on the surface, making a larger one would increase the complexity and increase the chance of failure. So we decided two separate missions that work together that fit within the same mission constraints. So they can have a lot of commonality in their EDL hardware and their cruise stage and everything like that. So the sample fetch rover is gonna be a simple rover made with a, you know, 
uh, you know, solar power. It's going to have your know, obvious little uh, robot arm to pick up samples that will have cameras and everything else. And it could potentially work alongside Perseverance because Perseverance could well be working in 2020, uh, you know, 2028, right? It's just not guaranteed. That's why it's doing this caching thing. And having two rover set, set, uh, fetching samples would obviously be a boon. The, the landers will have to land in a very tightly constrained area. I believe the current aim is within a 40 meter ellipse, which is, you know, pretty good. Uh, and I'm sure it'll work very, very well. The launch vehicle, the Mars Ascent vehicle, is being built by Lockheed using rocket engines from Northrop Grumman. For a long time, there was a lot of discussion about exactly what kind of propulsion would work well. Now, if you want to put something into a nice, good orbit, then uh, you know, liquid fuel propulsion is very good because you can turn it on and off. But the problem with Mars is that if you look at your bipropellants, then nitrogen tetroxide tends to freeze at the temperatures on the Martian surface, so you would need extra heaters, it would add complexity. Um, you know, Elon Musk and Mars and Robert Zubrin, they're all like, let's make propellant on Mars using the Sabatia process to create methane. That's great. It lets you send a much smaller vehicle to Mars and then build the heavy fuel on the surface. Problem is that technology is way out there. Another concept that was looked at was taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and splitting it into oxygen and carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide rockets is actually a real concept. The, the, and there people have developed the engines. The problem, I think, is always getting them to ignite cleanly and not have a hard start. But again, this technology was sort of out there on the edges. Uh, a hybrid rocket was considered. That would have the advantage. They could use a single stage hybrid rocket and have it throttle. But in the end, they went with the most reliable and well understood, well tested thing that they had. And that is a pair of solid rocket motors that Northrop Grumman are already building. And they just need to make sure that they're going to work at the low temperatures expected on the Martian surface. So this two stage rocket is about you know, 10 feet, three meters tall. It is not a big thing by any means. It lands on its side on the rover and there is a European built sample transfer arm that will take the samples from the fetch rover and store them in the top of the rocket into the, the sample container. And when the time comes to launch, obviously the rovers will retreat to a safe distance. There's one fantastic, well, fascinating moment about this that when you're launching a rocket, you like to have a nice, stable launch pad, right? You know, you're going to light that engine and it's going to blow you know, everything around near it. You don't want to have any debris getting blown off the sur surface of Mars and impinging back on the rocket. So I think JPL's current plan right now is to throw the rocket into the air about, you know, 15, 20 feet, right? Five or six meters. It's going to throw the thing up and then it's going to light the engine. And this is a technology which might seem wild and crazy, right? But actually, this has been a very well tested concept because this is how you launch missiles. <laughs> this is how you launch missiles out of silos. You toss them up using a charge and then they light their engine so that they don't slag everything underwater or destroy the, the rocket when it lights underwater. So there's actually a lot of uh, experience in lighting solid rocket motors while they are flying through the air with a great you know, grace. <laughs> So yeah, rocket, it's going to have a first stage, which is going to be use thrust vectoring for steering. Once it gets high enough, the second stage is going to use little RCS motors. It'll drop the fairing and it will ascend into orbit. And then over the next six months or so, they're going to perform a very careful rendezvous. The Mars return stage that has been sitting in orbit will make its way using a, its electrical propulsion and get very, very close so that it can actually retrieve the canister. So one of the reasons they don't want to have they want to have these as two separate stages is for planetary contamination rules. There's the strictest rules right now in terms of planetary contamination are for sample return from the high potential um, you know, active regions on Mars to Earth. And for that, they have to absolutely cut the link with anything that's been on Mars. So the spacecraft will open up, there will be a sample container inside there with a sealed uh, you know, surface that will be transferred to the return vehicle into another container, which is designed for entry, descent and landing. 
and you know then they'll leave the the remains in orbit. So from that point, it will take a couple of years to transfer back to Earth. And on the way there, uh, it'll target the landing site in the, the Utah test range. Probably, there might be other options. Now, again, avoiding contamination is incredibly important. It's, it's obviously incredibly unlikely that there will be any biological active material in here. But you don't know, and I totally understand that you might want to make sure that you don't similarly contaminate your sample with Earth life. So the container has to be able to handle any eventuality. And if you, you might think, oh, so it's going to come down, it's going to have a parachute, and maybe if that fails, there's an emergency parachute. But actually, turns out that it's a lot simpler if you just make your landing capsule able to survive landing in the event of a parachute failure. And if you can survive landing without a parachute, then why even include a parachute? So yeah, this is just going to be a re-entry vehicle that streaks through the atmosphere, slows down, and lands on the ground intact, right? <laughs> and that's what's going to get recovered. And then, of course, you're going to have all your magnificent amount of sampling to do. So this is, yeah, this is a very complex mission that we are looking forward to. It's going to take about $7 billion in total between all the missions are flying. And obviously, a bunch of that money is already on Mars in the form of the Perseverance rover doing its stuff. So it's not like we're just spending money to get these samples back. You're getting fringe you know, benefits. You're getting the science on the, the ground already. And I'm sure the Mars you know, sample fetch rover will have its own little life and little... I don't, I don't think it'll have a helicopter companion, but you, you never know. You know, plans happen. Another interesting thing about this whole thing is that the best trajectory, I believe, takes longer than expected because they want to launch during the ideal window in terms of velocity, but they want to arrive at Mars during the Martian spring because you're going to have everything that's solar powered there. Martian spring is usually after the dust storm season, and that gives them as long as possible to work on collecting the samples, putting them on the rocket, and making sure that it can launch before another dust storm kicks in. Having said that, the last big dust storm, well, the, the dust storm which killed Opportunity, that persisted well into the Martian Spring. So it's not guaranteed that landing Martian Spring is going to save you. So they still need to be careful with this exact timing and they need to be able to be robust against all of this. So yeah, Mars sample return pretty much has the whole de next decade figured out. Won't be surprised if there's further delays in this. In parallel, of course, there are other plans uh, going out there. Uh, Russia has said that they are sure that they can return, uh, you know, Mar Mars Grunt will return soil from Mars at some point. I'm not sure that will get off the ground given the, you know, the lean budget that it's been being given. Uh, Japan has the MMX, Martian Moons Explorer. They would like to basically recover samples from the one of the Martian moons. And, you know, this actually was tried in the 1990s with Phobos Grunt, but that never, that had its own problems and never made it to the target. So here's hoping that in just over a decade from now, we get a good close-up look at some freshly returned dirt from Mars. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.